So my topic is intensive berry production using greenhouses, hydroponics and substrates. My name is Nikki Mann, I've come from the central coast of New South Wales and I thank Mary for introducing me. I'd first like to make a big special thank you to Horticulture Innovation Australia and Nuffield Australia for, for sponsoring and investing in, in me. How they've done it and how they believed in me, I'd never know, but I'm not, taking, I'm not giving it back. Um, what do we do? My husband and I, Wade and I, our hydroponic rose grows on the central coast and we, grow, we did grow 6,000 square metres of hydroponic roses. Then I got a Nuffield scholarship and we pulled out 50% of our roses and we put in blueberries raspberries and while Wade was away this year on his GFP I've also implemented and planted more um, strawberries, some passion fruit, some citrus um, so while the cat's away the mice will play. I've got three beautiful children, Zinzan, Tane and Oregon and had I known how expensive labour was going to be in Australia I would have had more children back in Zimbabwe to be with us. Um, we also run two little retail shops uh, where we sell our roses directly to the public. We've got an online store and we run a bit of tourism. Talk about you know, trying anything to get money. Um, what did I study? Well, basically, what I wanted to look at, first of all, I knew nothing about the berry industry or about the growing of berries. So what else do you do is take a Nuffield Scholar and learn it all. So I had to first look at the Australian um, industry and look at the world industry and what was happening in the berry industry. Then I wanted to look at protected cropping and all the structures around the world, what was on offer from really sort of like low-tech to really high-tech. I wanted to also look at the substrates on offer and also look at all the types of containers um, that people were growing berries in and look at different hydroponic systems. Then I wanted to consider the pros and cons of these systems and compare them to the traditional way of growing berries. Then I wanted to analyse, you know, not wanting to just stick with one berry, I wanted to do four. So then I wanted to analyse the different berry crops available and how they actually grew in hydroponic systems. Then I wanted to try and come up with some recommendations, probably for our, ourselves first, because we knew nothing about the industry, and then disseminate some more to the rest of the Australian industry. And for anyone else in the protected cropping industry that was considering a different crop to grow within their structures. That was the plan. Okay, let's start with a global perspective of the berry industry. I'm sure most of you here um, probably enjoyed a few berries and stuff, but I don't think you realize that in the United States now, Berries are the number one category in, um, in revenue. So they, in fruit sales, they are number one. That's a huge thing. Um, they've taken over from apples and oranges and pears and all the rest, uh, you know, for um, value. And um, it's not in volume, by the way. Bananas are still number one in volume. But the berries has actually taken a, a big part of the market. And this is why I'm actually considering my study about intensifying production to create more of this beautiful fruit for, for the consumers to eat. This trend was seen in America, and this has echoed around the world about where the berry category is going. Some trends of production. This is the rubus industry, and rubus stands for raspberries and blackberries, by the way. And um, we went from 2008 being less than 500 tons produced in Australia a year, to now producing way over 4,500 tons. And it's, the trend is looking like it's going to continue. On the right-hand side of the, the slide is the Blueberry production, worldwide blueberry production. Again, all you can see is rising production levels. And we still don't think we're actually even near the saturation point or plateauing out. So, then I get back into the greenhouses. On my global focus study, um, my, my peers thought that they were on my private study because every time there was a greenhouse or some sort of structure protecting crops, I dragged them all in. And um, they learned a little bit about, about my study too. So I've seen all sorts of types of structures, from very simple hail netting here in Australia to really state-of-the-art Venlo glass houses in the Netherlands. I've seen shade netting and bird netting of all different types and um, sizes. And it was discovered, and also once I did the research, that white bird netting was actually far superior to black bird netting. Because, first of all, you got higher yields, it let a lot more light into the crop, and also a lot of the insects got stuck on the outside on the white mesh and didn't actually filtrate through to the crop. Something quite interesting. Then the, the high tunnels, uh, the plastic tunnels, and in Spain they're actually nicknamed Spanish tunnels because there's so many of them in Spain. In fact, I think you can see it from a satellite or something. But um, so the high tunnels, you see them everywhere and they're well, well received. They're quite, um, they don't cost a lot of money. And, um, but, and the growers are actually using them quite readily for berry production. Then you go into um, multi-span greenhouses like you see in Mexico. These are um, generally out of plastic. 
They've got a lot more sophistication than the, the, um, the tunnels because you can open and close your vents and you can actually put in um, shade structures. And then you're going up to something really new now, which is the um, retractable greenhouses, which are very, very exciting for the berry industry, especially here in Australia. These, the roots come back, and they can open, and the sides can go up. And I actually saw my first-hand retractable greenhouse in the Philippines at the International Rice Institute. Substrates. Oh, God, I love substrates. Um, substrates is something I want to just mention at this time is that sometimes you want to grow a crop like say you want to grow blueberries in Portugal the um, soil there is sometimes 8.5 in pH and blueberries like four, four, a pH of about 4 to 4.5 four so suddenly you can actually start growing these crops in substrates in a, in a region that would never be able to grow same thing in um, Chile there's a, a um, mycorrhiza is not present in the soil there and so now you can actually introduce mycorrhizal into the, the coca peat. Um, my standout, these are all the ones that I've discovered on my, my trip around the world. And the little one there with the, the blueberry bag is um, it's actually on our farm in Warnervale. And we actually did a special blend of um, coca peat with um, Irish peat moss, and um, that seemed to be the best. And the beauty about coca peat, it is, it's first of all, it's biodegradable, it's organic, so it's not gonna interfere with nature. Um, it's got a high water retention, it's got good air porosity, and it's also for a renewable source of, so it actually comes from the outside husks of coconuts. So it's a, you know, it's a waste product to most people, but it's great for the hydroponic and protective cropping industry. Containers. I'm sorry, I'm probably not the only one in here who gets excited about containers. I've looked at all types of um, containers used for the berry production, and obviously looking at different crops, or like from strawberries to blueberries to raspberries and blackberries, there were different things that worked, and one of the things that really stood out for me around the world is farmers are really innovative, and they find really cheap ways of, you know, something to grow, um, you know, their plants in. Um, my probably standout for me was um, the polyweave bags, the 40 litre polyweave bags. They seem to be the ideal um, container for blueberries, especially into the long term of protected cropping. In Portugal, I was really lucky to um, meet with a guy called Hugo. I'm sorry, I don't know his surname. I probably couldn't pronounce it either. But he had a little trial that he was doing with square pots and circular pots. And the little on the screen there, you see the little square pots. And the roots were lovely and white, and they, they were healthy. And then on the other one, they were the same variety. They were all root-bound and not so healthy. And the yield was about 200 grams difference with a square black pot. So that was quite a big standout and a hard moment for me. The, the trough systems for strawberries were fantastic, and I would recommend that rather than the grow bags. Grow bags are cheap and easy to use, but then they become a hazard when you try and get rid of the plastic after the life of the plants. Hydroponic systems. Um, some of the most um, amazing systems being used, obviously you've got your normal NFT and your aeroponic systems. I saw this one in uh, Port Macquarie for a pick your own, and um, it was actually a very good system for that business. Um, probably on a commercial scale, scale, it's not ideal, but the whole trend now is being able to recapture your runoff water, capture your nutrients, recycle it, and then reuse that water, which is definitely the way of the future when resources become, you know, um, you know, become scarce. The other big standout for me was in Watsonville, in, which is called, considered the berry heartland of America. There were 380 growers, berry growers in this region, and only one of them had adopted hydroponics, shown in the, the slide at the bottom. And um, I was absolutely gobsmacked that for a region that is so short of water, why they weren't all doing it. And um, they also, um, he was capturing his water and recycling and putting it back onto his, um, his raspberries and with great results. But he was an innovator and he was going to be leading the front. And it was actually alarming that no one else was actually you know, following him carefully or, or, or copying him. Okay, some of the pros and cons of protecting cropping hydroponics and substrates compared to traditional methods. You can actually increase your plant density. Um, here in New Zealand, you can see they've got three layers of strawberries in a, in a tunnel, and immediately they've got more plants per square meter than you would have out in a field. In these protected em environments, you can actually keep out the birds and the, most of the pests um, seen in the tunnels with the, the bird netting on the sides. With that, you can also implement really good successful IPM because you've got a, a closed structure, so you don't put on all your beneficials and then they get blown off to your neighbour. You keep them and they, the systems really work. This blueberry leaf is actually in our greenhouse and you suddenly get really big, vigorous plants. Obviously, the bigger the leaves, the more they photosynthesize, the faster they grow. You're getting incredibly big-sized fruit. 
So you can imagine, I think our customers are a bit disappointed. A pint of 125 grams of blueberries has only got about six blueberries in it um, because they're so big. It's great for labor savings. Um, there's a lot of advantages. You can actually control the environment. You can be precise with your feeds. So you're not waiting, wasting or leaching your nutrients into the waterways or the soils. Um, you can, it's very good to keep your, your workers working no matter what the conditions are outside. Um, so if it's raining, there's still work. And the same thing, um, you don't get a lot of wasted or, or, or cracked fruit or damaged fruit for pests and diseases. The cons, believe it or not, it does get hot in New Zealand. This is an example of scorching in a blueberry crop in a low tunnel in New Zealand. And this was actually a management issue. They had not actually up the sides and hadn't opened the vents. So this poor blueberry crop got scorched and this has got dire consequences. And this also happens when it gets really hot in the environments. It actually stifles some of the workers and your pollinators don't agree with the hot conditions. Another drawback with the intensive cropping is that you can't get the mechanical harvesters into these confined spaces. This raspberry harvester, I was privileged to see at Julian Rains, and you can imagine we wouldn't be able to fit that in the front door of our greenhouse, let alone repop raspberries. So that is a drawback going forward, but you know, technology is moving forward, and I'm sure someone will get onto it and you know, create a small mechanical harvester to fit into the greenhouse. The other thing is you can actually get a lot of dust accumulation on the leaves. This um, leaf was actually in Corindai, up in, uh, by Coffs Harbour, and uh, they've got just the low-tech Spanish tunnels. And um, unfortunately, it's very dusty and they've got a lot of traffic. And they, the, the leaves accumulate dust. And because they're not getting natural rainfall on, onto these leaves, it accumulates and you also get sometimes spray residue on there. And it doesn't clean off. And slowly but surely, it slows down the photosynthetic process. Okay, this slide actually speaks for itself. You know, when you're considering why would you use a substrate as opposed to soil, this was an experiment done in the Netherlands, and I was privileged to actually go and see this block while I was there. Um, they had the same variety, Aurora, the northern highbush blueberry variety, and they did a, a study for five years comparing the yields. I mean, look after year five, you've got basically um, 37,500 kgs per hectare as opposed to 8,250. If you want to work out the sums, that's a 450% 450, increase in yield by using substrates. That's got to be quite impressive. Okay, a few little recommendations if I would be so bold as to tell people who already know what they're doing in the strawberry industry what I would think they should do, is to adopt high-tech glass houses. Um, I do see that they've become very, very similar to the tomato industry with high-tech single, single tabletops so you can access the crop from either side. Um, troughs filled with cocoa peats and being able to plant your strawberries at an angle so that the fruit was well presented and easy to pick. Using bumblebees and honeybees overseas was just an absolute aha moment for me. We sit here in Australia jealous of all of them using bumblebees, but they actually really preferred the honeybees for sheer numbers and costs and how effective they really were. Um, obviously we don't get bumblebees on mainland Australia, but the Tasmanians always get one, one step ahead. Um, a cost for this sort of structure, you're looking at about 450 Australian dollars per square meter, so it is pretty expensive. And in the Netherlands, they're looking at a return on investment of about um, 15 years, and but they are yielding 15 kgs of strawberries per square meter. Compared to out in the soil, you're looking at maximum about 3 kgs if you're a good farmer. For blueberries, this is what we do. If I had a magic wand, I'd have a retractable greenhouse roof and retractable sides, because um, that would be the ultimate, to be able to vent and um, climate control a little bit easier, to get natural light into our greenhouses to help our pollinators would be just superb. Um, 40 litre bags, as I've mentioned before, a good mix of um, um, cocoa peat, Irish peat moss, perlite and mycorrhizae. This sort of structure will set you back about 100 Australian dollars per square metre, but the yields, year one in a blueberry we could get one kg of fruit, and you're looking up after about um, year three, you're looking at five kgs of, of berries per, per um per plant, which is amazing. Considering in an outdoor environment, you'll be lucky to get uh, a yield after year three. So um, for, rubus, for, for the rubus, what would I recommend? Obviously, I love those little pots and things with a lot of aeration because um, raspberries are prone to a lot of um, root diseases, and Phytophthora and Fusarium. So be able to be able to you know, get a lot of air into the base of the, the rubus is a huge advantage. And it also does a little bit of um, air pruning of the roots as well. Because I'm not sure if any of you know about uh, rubus or raspberries, they just seem to spring up somewhere else if they get anywhere near the soil. Um, same thing, I would also have a retractable greenhouse roof and root sides. 
and I'd also implement a linear way of um, growing the fruit so you could get a lot more plants per into your greenhouse. And this sort of system, you could actually reap 20 tons of first class fruit um, in this type of system, which is fantastic. Um, that one. Some of the key findings from my study. All the people that I saw that were using greenhouses, hydroponics and um, substrates were all doing it for timing purposes. To come early in the season, produce fruit earlier, later and without interruption. They were minimizing their risk from diseases and losses from insects and pests. They were having been consistent with their quality and the quantity of their fruit. The supermarkets love it that you can actually produce fruit you know, early, late and without interruption. The nutrient and water savings is, an, is, uh, is unbelievable. Um, farming land is limited, so suddenly you've got all these options that you can actually put greenhouses on the top of buildings and you know you can grow anywhere really with, without even soil. Some of the unexpected findings, and I'm going to have to race a little bit, sorry, um, is methyl bromide is still used in the United States. It was phased out in Africa in 2000. I don't know what they're going to do in two years' time to uh, fumigate their soil without methyl bromide. Spotted wing drosophila, this is the plague of Europe, we need to really protect our borders and make sure we don't get that here. The control of genetics in the berry industry is quite frightening. A few powerful breeders control the genetics and they are, they are coupled in with some marketing companies. Honeybees, we've got an advantage, we've got to use the honeybees as pollinators and really embrace that. Another thing that really alarmed me is how well raspberries, which are meant to be typically a very soft fruit, how well they were travelling from South Africa to the UK and still being sold six days after arrival. Controlled atmosphere storage of blueberries is quite an, another thing that we really need to think about because they can now get um, chili, chili can now export to Europe quite easily. Is this the future of intensive berry production? I'd like to leave you with that. Lastly, I just would like to say a special thank you to my group and to Wade and to my kids. Thank you.